So I I think I think I figured out our new marketing scheme. This is All right, hit me with it. This is the first podcast where one of the hosts just dies in the middle. That that's me. I'll just directly <laughs> Why did you have to leave it vague? <laughs> like like I might be the one who died. I by the way, Albert, this is the episode where you die. So if I just hear like a noise fall over mm-hmm. and like your DX racer falling to the ground, <laughs> I can assume you passed out or died, right? You should probably call the ambulance th- at that point. <laughs> okay. Then the sirens will actually be for you for once. Yes. Welcome, everyone, to TRC Podcast, a bi-weekly podcast where we try to bring the past and present together. Actually, we're a video game podcast. So welcome, everyone, to TRC Podcast, a video game podcast where we try to bring the past and present together through bi-weekly examination of news and retros on older games. I'm one of your hosts, Tristan Jung. I'm your other host, Albert Corston. And welcome to episode six. That had zero enthusiasm. Let me try that again. Welcome to episode six. Don't kill yourself, friend. Was that just yelling? I, I, I don't know. I feel like you're going to hurt yourself. <laughs> that was the most enthusiastic I've ever heard you in my life. <laughs> I felt like you were going to hurt yourself. Unfortunately to you viewers, um, us, the, the host, the both of us, are still living in the past in pre-3 season. E3 starting tomorrow, right? Yeah, you got some... Some EA going on tomorrow, some EA. Yeah, so we can't bring any E3 news just yet. Just yet. So there might be a special. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. If uh, if I'm not dead by tomorrow, then maybe we'll do an episode. No need to fret. We still got your news. I, we still got your research notes. We still got your uh, SoundCloud, sound clip hints, and your Metacritic scores. We'll be... And our dates. Don't forget our release dates. And our release dates will those be... Those are very important, because those... Our, oh, God. our program is uh, going according to schedule, so let's... You could literally lie about the release date, and that would not hinder or help me at all. You know, one day I will do that. <laughs> no, don't do it. Okay. So let's let's start some news. Let's let's grab, let's grab some news out of the bag. All right. You want to grab a bag one? of news? Uh, sure, I will grab one. It's very recent news, but I feel like we should talk about it. Mm-hmm. Um, So CD Projekt Red, uh, thieves or hackers or whatever you want to call it, have accessed network drives or no details on it, but accessed essentially confidential documents related to their highly anticipated Cyberpunk 2077, which I swear to God is going to come out in 2077, (laughs) and essentially are holding CD Projekt Red ransom, stating that they will release those files to the public if they do not pay them um some unannounced amount of money to which cd project red has essentially said no we do not deal with hackers or ever or whatever we will not pay you money we do not yeah. negotiate with terrorists with terrorists exactly i was gonna say that but i'm glad you brought it up <clears throat> um and so mm-hmm. i guess one thing to bring up is this is not the first time this has happened to cd project red um it happened with the witcher 3 wild hunt where some key story elements were leaked, stolen from a Google Drive from an employee, and were ju- they weren't held ransom that time, they were just leaked. Mm-hmm. And so, CD Projekt Red, man, you gotta step up your security or something. I mean, like, don't just put it in a text file, guys. Like, don't save your images as, as a text file. I don't even know where I'm going with this. I don't even know where you're going with this, man. But <laughs> sure, don't save your images in text files. Um, Stop putting your stuff, like, like confidential game... Who uses confidential game files on a Google Drive? Like, wouldn't they have... I mean, it's not like some corporate secrets, but you assume they have something like basic... In order to access our files outside of the company, mm-hmm. you need to be on a VPN, mm-hmm. right? But I mean, I guess they're in Poland. I don't know thing how how stuff works I, there. Yeah, I think um, computers are kind of different there. Uh, I, I assume we will not be hearing a third story after this, though. I I feel like they'll learn their lesson after two tries, especially now that they're actually getting ransomed. Uh, 
the one thing I hope, just the, some some hopefully good stuff that comes from this, is that the gaming community doesn't really stand for this. And if people leak it, if anyone tries to share it on any sort of uh, like Reddit mm-hmm. or on NeoGAF mm-hmm. or on any other websites that they won't propagate this information. Like if someone's like, I really hope that gaming journalists do not promote this. Like if they actually do release all this information. Yep. I mean, I hope no one posts an article and be like, here's what's in the, the notes that they stole. Like, I, I, feel I like, hope we can all form together. I feel like most gamers are, you know, sympathetic towards these type of situations. Like, it, it's happened before in the past. Yeah, um, and especially to a developer who deserves it, who treats the gaming fan base with such, like, what's the word I'm looking for? Respect? Respect, yeah. Like, they don't try to nickel and dime us. Mm-hmm. Like, they're really good to their fan base, and I feel like the least we can do to pay them back is if they release this information that we don't propagate at all. We just like, nope, good job, you guys. You guys took information. We're not going to look at it. But we'll reach in our bag. Mm-hmm. And we'll take our next story, which is Jay Pinkerton, a writer at Valve, mm-hmm. has left the company. And this is significant, not because Jay Pinkerton has worked on uh, games such as like the TF2 videos and I think he did um, uh, some of the other Orange Box games. Um, but this is big because Valve has lost three other of their big writers in the past two years. And some of the biggest ones, the, the other big one uh, that people might know is Eric Wolpaul. Yep, He left uh, the company last year, I think it was. So, I mean, Valve, and, and uh, according to this Rock, Paper, Shotgun article... Valve only has one writer left out of their five from two years ago. So unless they've hired more that we're unaware of, but mm-hmm. um, I, the other the other names of the two other writers were Chet Falasek and Mark Laidaw. Laidlaw. I mean, who needs writers um, unless they're using these writers to write like the um, y- you know how the Dota two items, like the cosmetic items, they all have a little backstory in them. Yep. Yeah, unless that's what they're using them for. I feel like Valve is not really a place where you need writers anymore. Who, who needs writers when you don't make games? Oh. <laughs> I mean, I went there. Damn. Yeah, I mean, who knows what, what they're doing at this point. They're, I guess they're happy as is, making money from all their games. Yeah, I mean, the rumors, the rumors from the past years have been they're working on VR games, they're working on VR games. We've seen nothing come out, and honestly... If Valve comes out with a VR game, I mean, honestly, part of it's because I don't have a VR capable anything. Uh-huh. I, I mean, a rig or even a system like an Oculus Rift or a or a Vive. A Vive but like, I'm not that hyped for VR games. Like, I mean, it's a lot of know. setup, right? A lot of yeah. S- but I mean, even if I cost. had that setup, I wouldn't be like super hyped for a VR game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know. They have all the money they want. They can do whatever they want, but yeah, another, another, I guess, key component of their company leaving. So sad news. Um, sad news. Yeah, hopefully the last one sticks around in case they decide to make Half Life Three. <laughs> I heard the, that one left a while ago. That guy left a while ago. Oh, okay. Well, there yeah, we go. Yeah, the original writer for Half Life is gone. So. All right, so reaching into our news bag, uh, this past, what was it, Wednesday? Mm-hmm. The Pokemon Company had their Nintendo Pokemon Direct, and they announced Pokemon Tournament DX, or Deluxe Edition, as well as a, li- a little, little, little babby tease for Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Now, tell me, Albert, are any of these new games? Well, we don't know yet. We don't know. So, Pokemon Ultra, or let's go to the one we know about. Uh-huh. Pokemon, Pokemon Tournament, releasing, what, September 22nd or something? Mm-hmm. Something around there, I think. Um, that one is going to be the same one as, as the main Pokemon, but it's going to have three new characters? Five new characters? I don't characters? remember these. Five new characters? It's going to have new characters. Yeah. It's not going to just be like a, a, like an HD port or whatever. It's going to have new characters, new content, and it's going to have all the updates, apparently, that they some of the updates that they didn't patch in or something like that. Yep. Um, but the question mark is Pokemon Ultra Sun and Moon, and Ultra Moon, which 
I, they said something about a brand new story, and people are wondering if that's going to be just addition to the old story, or if we're getting like a Black and White 2 where it's going to be a completely new game. It's adding in the new uh, Legendary, I forget his name, I don't remember the specifics. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's like a Black White 2 situation here. I just don't think Ultra is the way to do it. That's a really weird... I wasn't too too stoked on that title. I mean, I think the biggest disappointment was that a lot of people were looking out for a mainline game on the Switch. Yeah, yeah. And honestly, I can see they're disappointed, but at the same time, they kind of set themselves up, right? I, I don't think the Pokemon company has said anything in the past months about... I mean, people are speculating it's in development, but, I mean, going to be announced this year, a new Pokemon game for the Switch? Mm-hmm. I mean, they were I'm hiring. okay with it because... Remember, they're, they're hi- exactly they're hiring just just a couple one of our episodes ago. Yep. So, I mean, there's no way they're ready to announce a game seven months later, unless it's maybe a direct port. But, um, I think that as I want their first game on the Switch to be great, so I'm fine with them taking extra time to make it. It's fair enough. Yep. Um, I mean, I'm a little sad, but at the same time, it's like a classic Gabe Newell, right? Like a a a rushed game is bad forever, but. A game that's delayed is merely delayed for longer, even though there's no delay because there's no announcement. The same thing. I'm just excited because I didn't own a Wii U, and now I actually get to play all these games. <sighs> Thanks, well, Nintendo. Well, guess what, Tristan? I have a Wii U, and I get to buy these games again. <laughs> Why don't you just oh, sell boy. your Wii U versions of the games? That's true, I could. But I kind of want to play Wind Waker HD still, so... Oh, I can't wait Which for Wind Waker it. HD two, H H D D H double D H double D H double D H D squared. All right, you have anything more on that one? Anything more about Pokemon? Um, no. I personally really like the Alolan Islands. Is that's what they were called? Yeah. Um, and I'm I'm okay with buying another game, um, set in that region, as long as you know. They fix maybe the FPS issues. You want to grab our, our last story out of the bag? Yeah, let me fish it out there. It's fucking rotten because uh, I fucking hate this news. Um, Nintendo finally dropped a little bit more details about their online, paid online subscription service, um, similar to PlayStation Plus and Xbox Live Gold. Um, it was supposed to come out this summer. But they delayed it to 2018, which means playing online until then will be free for us. Um, one month will cost four bucks, three months will cost eight bucks, and a year's worth will cost twenty dollars, which is a fair amount less. Um, PS Plus is sixty dollars, and Xbox Live Gold is fifty dollars. Forty dollars. Forty dollars. Forty dollars. Yep, forty dollars. Um, so I mean, it's a lot. They dropped it last, or two years ago, they dropped it from 60 to 40. Okay. I think it was, yeah. But it's, it's a lot cheaper, but at the same time, it's a lot shittier, IMO. Uh. I mean, I'm fine. I mean, did you talk about, I mean, the rumors are that they're, so they originally came out with a thing, right, where it was, oh, you get to download a free, uh, classic, essentially virtual console game, and you can play it for the month, and then when the month ends, you'll get a new game. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, the rumors are is that they're doing a Netflix sort of subscription-based thing where as long as you're subscribed to Nintendo's online service, you will get access to the full library of whatever I call it virtual console because that's the thing that it relates to, but whatever they want to call it, that library wait, of games. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, wait, wait, wait. Let, let's rewind a little bit. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, when, when we have online services, uh, we usually expect like basic features to be there, but that's what I'm mostly concerned about because it sounds like you're gonna have to download an app to your phone to like yeah. set, up, set up groups and like do voice chat. Did you see the Splatoon headset? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, don't. I'm. I'm okay with it because of the price tag. Okay. Honestly, if it was more than thirty dollars, uh-huh. I would like go crazy. But for me, I don't even look at. I look at it for if that library thing is true. Yep. It's for me. It's not twenty dollar Nintendo online. Uh huh. For me, it's twenty dollar Nintendo Virtual Console, and we'll throw an online on the side. Oh my god! Like like that's what that's okay. how I look at okay. it. Okay, that's fair enough. If if it's true, because honestly, 
I'm going to play online, but I'm not going to use any of the voice chat features. Like, oh my gosh. Bleh. Like, if I play a game, uh-huh. I'll play it with, like, friends, uh-huh. and then I'll just be with you about the Switch. I'll just bring it to my computer, and then I'll just jump on Discord with you, and I'll just talk to you that way. Hmm. Are you hearing this, Nintendo? But, but Im- imagine the clunky setup of, like, wanting to... I guess... Actually, never mind. I was going to weird bring up a weird scenario, but that wouldn't happen. I was going to say, if you want to, like, play it on the go, yeah. but then you won't have Wi-Fi connection, so never mind. No, but you'll have just someone and like, just tether off of it, right? <laughs> what if you could, though? What if you could? I'm pretty sure you can. That it's would be a cool standard thing. standard Wi-Fi, right? That's true, but that'd be cool if you could tether, like based directly on like the jack. Ah, uh, I see. I mean, I'm just not looking forward to buying a fucking audio splitter to talk online, and have to bring my phone everywhere if I want to play online. Wait, doesn't the Splatoon headset come with a splitter? Oh, but if you don't buy the Splatoon headset, yeah, yeah, that's kind of weird. I'm probably not going to use any of that at all. <sighs> oh well, but uh, I guess we didn't. I don't know if you said this in the headline. It's delayed, so yeah, yeah. It's not. It's coming out sometime next year. Which, eh, I'm fine. Nintendo's that giving us we'll ten dollars get... back by not charging us right now. I almost think. I mean, they're obviously not uh, set on what they want for it yet. But at the same time, they they can't justify that twenty dollars price tag yet. Mm-hmm. I mean, in the summer we have Arms and Splatoon two coming out, but yep. there's no other multiplayer games online for this which that justify paying twenty dollars a year. Mario Kart. Maybe Mario Kart. I mean, they need to get something with more longevity to it. I think. Yeah, like uh, like Super Smash. S- oh, Essentially, yeah. Smash. There you go. Right? They just need sp- they need to really Smash, like either a remaster or a new one. I don't think a new one's coming out, so definitely a remaster. Have you seen Sakurai lately? Have you seen him around? Where is he? Is he dead? He's dead. Oh, okay. They replaced he's, him with an dead. AI. <laughs> yeah. You know, and whoever made the Kirby games, oh. I know you like more 3DS Kirby games. I do, I know. Alrighty, right. that's all the news. Um, now ever. we get to... Ever. No more news ever again. <laughs> that's how you said it. That's all the news. Yeah, period. Cancel period. E3, guys. <laughs> cancel E3. <laughs> Please don't cancel E3. Don't cancel it. I'm excited for E3. Should have gone, man. It's available to the public this year. I thought it was next week. I told you this. Oh, All that's this right. time I thought it was next week. Fuck. Mm. Oh well. Yep. Um. So this is the fun part of the episode. For first time listeners, this is where we do a retro on an older game. Older is subjective. I usually pick something that's more than 10 years old. Um, Albert tries to guess it. And then after, you know, we do the big reveal, we chat about it for about half an hour. Um, and I usually yeah, drop this is the This is the retrospective. Yeah. So, today, I picked out a game released on... Ugh. I don't even... I don't... <laughs> I'm stretching. <laughs> I'm, I'm prepping myself. I'm Reggie. I'm getting my body ready. Okay, I was like, I didn't even start yet, buddy. Um, <laughs> Are you gonna... Oh, no. I, I got offended. Um, released on September 10th, 2001. All right. We're looking a little later here. So that's like what? That's like the PS1 GameCube era? Nothing. I, I'm not going to guess it from that. <laughs> that just helps me narrow down like what era we're talking okay. about here. You said PS1? I said PS1 and GameCube. Okay. Uh, Do I get more hints? I don't I don't have any ideas. <laughs> All right. That's it. That's the end of the episode. Al, Al, we're doing a good game. He didn't get it. Oh, it's sometimes fun. Um. All right. Metacritic score. 92 out of 100. Oh, boy. Okay. So, I mean, let's, let's kind of... I that don't... means it's a good game. Oh, wow. We, we mainly cover good games, because that's what we <laughs> want to talk about. I, I want to pick a game at one point that's just like 23 out of 100 on Metacritic. Big Rigs, Over the Road Racing. <laughs> let's go. Let's, let's talk about this game. <laughs> let's talk about it. Um. Okay. That's, I mean, that's fine. Give me those, give me those, give me that release consoles. Give me those release consoles. Okay. I was afraid it might narrow it down too much, but, you know, it, I'm not really being helpful here, so I'll drop it. It was released on the Game Boy Advanced. Oh, God. Ooh. 93. 92? 91? What was it? Oh, yeah. I, Albert, what difference does it make? A 91 I mean, game and I... a 92 game? <laughs> 
I just don't want to like you said it like ten seconds ago, okay. and then I say a different number, and they're all like that idiot. It was ninety one. Oh, okay. Listening, I thought you had a mental list of like. Games Let me still... calculate. I'm I'm running it through my Fibonacci sequence <laughs> in my brain right now, yeah. and I am deciphering the SHA-256 algorithm. Uh-huh. It was it was ninety two. I'll get the I'll get the game. It was ninety two. The ninety two. Yeah. I was in between. Okay, okay. Game Boy Advance. I'm trying to think of good Game Boy Advance games right now. I have no idea. I, I the internal bias in me wants to say Advance Wars, but I don't think Advance Wars one did that well. And Tristan's like he had it, but I won't tell him. Um, what other good Game Boy Advance games? I mean, we did Super Mario World, which came out for the Game Boy Advance. Uh, um, I mean, at some point, yes, as a port. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think. There's like, there's a bunch of Pokemon games. I don't know. I don't know if today's the day for Pokemon game though. I don't think it is. Uh, like, okay, keep giving me. I I want that sound hint. Give me that sound hint. Yeah. Drop a beat on this guy. I'm gonna drop some beats on you. Some beats by Dre. Okay, you motherfucker. You motherfucker. <laughs> what? You gave me Advance Wars? <laughs> oh my god. I thought it was good timing oh. we were talking about the other day. Hey, Advance Wars. Hey. Um, yeah. Okay, let me do so my... So the title is Advance Wars. Oh, you. Oh, sorry, I just started to cut that out. Alright. Advance Wars... Released in Japan as Game Boy Wars Advance is a turn-based tactics video game developed by Intelligent Systems and published by Nintendo. Let's do first thoughts. All right, Albert. Drops on first thoughts. Do I rant? Is this where I rant? Do I rant later or do I rant now? Uh, Tell me, buddy. This is okay. We're gonna we're gonna rant later. Okay. We're gonna rant later. Okay. We're gonna first thoughts. I'm like we're gonna scared. first thoughts. Okay. This is my favorite strategy game series of all time, and the reason it's because the combat is simple, the game design is simple, but it has so much depth of strategy to it. In addition to the uh, commanding officers, the COs, and the different powers, and they all have their different spins on it, right? Like, this game is legendary. Yeah, so my thoughts, I actually played this really late, like after I played Fire Emblem. So I always thought that this was like a spinoff from the Fire Emblem series. Um, You're about to trigger me really hard right now. I know I am. You're going to trigger me (laughs) so hard <laughs> um to be honest i never got into advanced wars i like the whole fire emblem system a lot better so i'm biased in that way but i do enjoy the artwork and the uh graphics styles i i hear your voice cowering right now <laughs> because i'm about to yell into the microphone <laughs> and swear you out of this podcast <laughs> That's why the police are here right now. They're arresting me for liking Fire Emblem more than Advance Wars. Exactly, and they should. Um, do you actually know the history behind the Wars series? Define the history behind the Wars series. <laughs> like, behind the game development? Or, like, the actual story in the game? No, I mean, like, d- did you know there were games before Advance Wars? I remember there being one, but I've never played it. Okay. I remember looking it up once, and there was one. So if you want to drop some history on me. Yeah, let's start with some history before you go on your rant or whatever. That's going to take up the remaining 20 minutes. Okay, I won't take that one. Um, so Advanced Wars is part of a series called The Wars series, um, developed by, by Intelligent Systems. They actually really there, there were f- six games before Advanced Wars in that series. Um, the first one came out on the NES in 1988, and that was followed up by a couple of others on the Game Boy, SNES, Game Boy Color, um, but none of these were released in outside of Japan, actually. Um, and kind of the reason behind that was Nintendo thought the games were too complicated and the Western gamers would not be able to understand. Oh my goodness. Once again, Japan shitting on the intelligence of Western <laughs> gamers all the time, man. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, eventually they were making this game. 
um, for the Game Boy Advance. It was kind of be kind of supposed to be a launch title, but things kind of got delayed. And um, like I I don't know how should I just go into full on fucking history lesson, or do you want me to pause? Like what, Professor Jung? I have a no. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. Okay. Let me let me do the history lesson first. So intelligent systems. Um. Do not. Get them confused with intelligent games who made uh, such hits as PGA European Tour, Lego Stunt Rally, and... Oh, dude, those are some legendary titles I know, right there, yeah, man. like, don't get them fucking confused. Um, intelligent Systems was a company uh, where they got hired to basically port Famicom disk system games to the NES. And eventually Nintendo liked them so much that they're basically a first party developer. And what ended up happening is um, in terms of Advance Wars, uh, they kind of want to dumb down the game, right? Yep. Um, because Nintendo thought that the previous games in the series were too sophisticated or, you know, like casual gamers wouldn't like it. So that's why they went with like this very colorful design. Um so they can cater to children and they also made kind of diff the difficulty curve a, a bit more gradual um i think albert can testify that, or confirm that later um and then eventually they were sending it to the uh the qa testers um and they were like dude this, this is amazing let's just release it everywhere and that's how north america got the fans voice. And so was the beginning of a tale of a great series of games. I'm going to save my rant till the end. Okay. I feel like let's talk about the game here. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's talk, let's talk about the CO. Okay. Well, I'll give a little description about the game. So the game is, it's a 2d top down map thing. Think of like Civ and like tiles. I mean, think of like Civ and tiles and stuff. And you, you can capture cities to gain economy. And then you spend that economy on units and then it's it's turn based, so you move and your opponent moves, and whoever destroys all the other team's units or captures their HQ, they win the game. And one reason I like this game, um, they said that the strategy. You talked a lot about how Nintendo was scared of being too complex or not complex enough or whatever, whatever kind of judge. This game is great because it's really easy to pick up and just play, but. There's so many advanced tactics and so much strategy you learn while playing the game that it can get really in depth as well. So it's 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 like what's what's that term? Uh, something with shallow ponds and lakes, something like that. It's like Shrek. There's a lot of layers. Yeah, it's like there's a lot of layers to it. It's an onion, guys. Okay, <laughs> we went from lakes to onions, yep. but still. Um, the other thing I liked is the story in this. The campaign in this game is amazing. Okay. All of the CEOs have amazing personalities, okay? From, like, your your main character guy, Andy, who's, like, your your new commanding officer just got out. Uh, there's, like, uh, he's learning the ropes of how to command and all that stuff. And then suddenly there's an attack and stuff is happening and people think that other nations are attacking each other. And then uh, there's also so much comedy in these characters, mm -hmm. like uh, how... The one of the, the the leader of the yellow comet faction named Kanbe is like in the first game is just some fanatical, obviously Japanese World War Two imperialistic dictator of their country, and so he he would always have he would always be like hell bent on aggression. So uh, the famous line that always that I remember from that game is there's a map where he has one base and he's like, oh, Kanbe has a base. Kanbe shall deploy a mountain of troops from his one base. And that was always funny. And then how uh, just when the characters are interacting with each other, like uh, the Olaf character, who's the the head CEO of the Blue Moon faction, he's the uncle of Andy, the main character. And so he always makes fun of him when he calls him like, uh, like Papa Olaf or something like that. I forget exactly. But there's so much 
so much substance to the characters in this game that it since it is more cartoony um in terms of like the fake war that that it's it's not a serious sort of game where it's just fun to like lay back and relax and watch these characters um fight through or in i guess in the end of like the middle of after fighting a long battle just watch them goof around a bit and there are some serious moments not necessarily in the first game but more in the in the sequel games but uh yeah i could talk more about the campaign if you want but I don't know if you want to say anything. I've been talking a lot. Um, I, I mean, keep talking. One, I love I mean, this that's game. fine. We're, I think we're having a good back and forth. Um, one one note that I have is they were definitely trying to go away from realistic warfare. Basically, um, the word they used was disfigure. Like they they don't want to use like real guns, right? Like everything yeah. everything's very cutesy in the game. Um, yeah. And even when people die, it's not like there's, you know, heads blowing up or something like that. Like, like, yeah, like, so, so when you enter a combat scene, like, uh, the two sides go on the left and the right, the, the game goes to, like, a combat screen, it's just, like, they, the two sides go against each other, mm-hmm. and, like, when infantry, just, like, normal foot soldiers, when they, quote-unquote, die, they just kind of, like, fly off the, the left side or the right side of the screen when they die. Yeah. It's, like, their death animation. I mean, when tanks blow up, they blow up, but it's not like there's any guts or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I mean I, I think that's how they ended up appealing really well um, because I, I know in Asia there's a lot of like war simulation games right um, yeah uh, what's what's the other strategy one that's very popular it's like the three kingdom one yeah um, and there's also like dynasty warriors and all that and those are more I wouldn't say dynasty warriors is realistic but <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're not as like popping as this so it was, yeah. it was definitely different for its time. Yeah. Um, but going back to the campaign, uh-huh. um, my favorite part is the the reveal towards the last... You're talking about difficulty curve. The game, it definitely has a good difficulty curve, at least the first one, if I recall. Mm-hmm. Um, how It's definitely like training missions. And then you start... Uh, you kind of start going to like... Essentially, the, the campaign is broken up into multiple segments where it's like... Uh, you fight on the orange star, which is like your homeland first, and once you push the enemy out, you go to blue moon, and then it gets a little more difficult, and then you go to yellow comet, and it gets more difficult, and then you get to green earth, and that's like, that's when it really starts ramping up, and then the game's final, the antagonist appears, Sturm, some weird alien Martian guy, when when you're a kid and you're playing, you're like, who's that? Like, that's that's some weird alien dude. Uh-huh. Um, and their black hole is their, is their army name, I guess, if you want to put it, and those last... I think it's like three missions against black hole are grueling um but a cool thing i liked about it is spoiler alert if you haven't played this game in the past 16 years i'm going to spoil something um depending on how you beat the missions in each of the blue moon yellow comet and green earth depending on which missions you choose and how you beat them the the final battle is you get one co from each of those three factions mm-hmm. and Depending on how you beat those missions earlier, I keep saying that. Um, that's that's who which COs will appear as your teammates. I see. So if you really cheese it, you get the really bad combos of CO, which is like, I don't know. I think it was like Drake mm-hmm. and Sonia, who's like, and uh, Drake is like good with naval units. And on that last map, there's no naval ports. Yep. And Sonia's good in fog of war. And on that last map, it's not fog of war. Oh, good. <laughs> And then I think there was something else where that game had it where, because it was the first game in the series, where if an ally used, so Drake has CO power with Tsunami and it did one damage to all the units mm-hmm. and cut their fuel in half, mm-hmm. it would hurt your allied units because it wasn't coded right. Oh, so like what the fuck? Yeah. There was a bug? Yeah. Yeah. Well, not really a bug per se. They just didn't have like the teammate mechanics coded very well in the last mission. Uh-huh. So yeah, it would like hurt your friend's unit. So like you'd get a CO power and you wouldn't want to use it. Oh, like, I see. It would just hurt your own guys. But that was a really cool dynamic, like, how you played through the... You weren't you weren't aware at the time, but how you played through the campaign mm-hmm. affected your allies on the last map. I see. I mean, that that's crazy, because, like, these are all things that modern games struggle with, right? You know, like, good character development, great uh, difficulty curve, good non-linear gameplay. Yeah. And the fact that they were able to kind of nail all this on a handheld... Um, 16 years ago, it's it's pretty crazy. I mean, definitely. I think to go into the future titles, they they tried the the first one. The first game was definitely the most lighthearted 
of the franchise, and I mean definitely with the last game, uh, Days of Ruin, where they completely wiped the uh, macro world, whatever it was called, that setting, and they went to like their new setting, mm-hmm. where it was like a post-apocalyptic environment. Uh, the game definitely got more serious in terms of uh, uh, kind of the, the background and the storytelling, mm-hmm. but I feel that it they should, I think they went a little too far towards the end of the series, in my opinion. Um, and definitely, uh, not it's not uh, the original game, but going on to the series in general, the more COs they started adding, mm-hmm. some of them really kind of fet, felt hit or miss. Yep. Um, and I don't want to talk too much about the sequel, because that's not our original game, but uh, in the second game, Black Hole became its whole faction, and they had four COs on there. Yep. And there was, like, Lash and Hawk and Adder. It's like some of the, like, some of the characters that definitely fleshed out, like, Hawk and lash but the other ceo is like who she's i see him sometimes he says a few lines and you don't really know much about him and so the first one definitely um due to the small roster of characters had a lot of uh connection with the player in terms of getting to know them a little more and kind of their personalities i I mean that's a bit discouraging because uh in my notes um at least for the first game it, uh, like they took balancing very very seriously um like they were balancing maps uh continuously basically they almost like c- delayed their launch because they would just play the same maps over and like hundreds of times just to make sure everything's working correctly yeah um I, and i think that's where a lot of the praise came from um just because like the maps look simple but there's so many little uh what do you what do you call it details um intricacies yes exactly that you know make it interesting to play on and and there's definitely this huge aspect of of the game where the 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 big meat of the game was definitely in the campaign but then the, the kind of what i what the real meat for me as someone who enjoys the difficult aspect of this game is the war room mm-hmm. and that's where you play maps where uh, some of them are easier, some of them are balanced, but towards the end, the difficult war rooms is where the AI has a considerable advantage over you at the start. Like, they start with more property, so their income's a lot higher than you, yep. and you have to overcome those odds via strategy to beat the opponent. And you eventually get to this part where, especially when the new game started coming out, where you would just look at a map. You could just look at the map and say, which CEO is best for this map? That's That's when you know that the map design was so crucial to that game where you would have to study the map to know who the best CO uh, was for that situation and not that you couldn't win as any CO there definitely you, you could win I would say arguably almost every any map as any CO but um, to get the top rank like that S rank score on that map you had to choose typically between a couple of COs in order to score very well I see. And that that was good because it it enforced mastery of not just learning being a one trick pony mm-hmm. and always playing the same CO. Yep. Um, it would it would force you to learn how to play other COs because they were more advantageous on different maps, like a map with that's small with a bunch of hills. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sammy, who's the infantry expert, tended to shine on those because her units were cheap; they could pass the terrain quickly, and she could overwhelm her opponents um, due to the small map size with her infantry. And then <laughs> going to a weird uh, – I used it a little bit with my brothers back in the day, but this game did have local multiplayer. Mm-hmm. You could attach a Game Boy Advance link cable yep. between your devices, and you could play Fog of War or whatever type of map. Mm-hmm. And if I recall, the first game did have the map editor, right? Yep. Yeah, so there was a map editor, so you could make your own maps in this game and play with them. And honestly, half the time when I was a kid, I would just make the one where – two opponents and you'd start with 25 so you could just max out that money and go ham with the strongest units <laughs> that was always really fun like you got bombers and medium tanks going at each other it's like just it's like the dota equivalent of just all mid you just make a, that's, a pretty, that's pretty much that's pretty much it <laughs> uh, and i mean one of my maps was literally just the whole map was road uh. <laughs> road and then city <laughs> yeah so um yeah 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you cover mostly all. I want to go into my rant points. eventually. Um, my minor rant. Yeah, let me see if there's anything that you didn't really cover. It, I feel like you did. You even did the multiplayer stuff. You went over units, terrain, COs. I didn't go over units that much, but well, I mean, we're uh, going to. We, this doesn't need to be a like a walk through. What is this game? Yeah, <laughs> this is why. Uh, so on the first mission, you want to move your infantry up three. <laughs> there were walkthroughs for that game. Hello, um, hello, listeners. And there were little. <laughs> There were here's a little interesting quirk about that game, uh, strategy wise with a, with AI. If you had an APC mm-hmm. within the range of any enemy unit, they would always attack the APC first. No, oh. that was a weird AI quirk with the first the first advance. Force. APCs can't APCs. even attack, right? They they're just like this no, they cannot attack. Thing. Maybe that's why they always attack because they're like free free target, right? Can't uh, attack back. I see. Yeah. Yep. Um, you even went over the story, so I mean. I'm glad I picked this game because I don't have to talk. Oh, actually, there's one but, trivia. Um, hmm. was it called Orange Star? Orange Star, yes, that is. Uh, in oh, I know the... what you're gonna talk about right now. Oh God, <laughs> what, what, are gonna you gonna got, what are we gonna talk about? <laughs> are you gonna talk about how Nell was an unlockable CO? No. Ha. Oh. Ha. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> no, they. Okay. Uh, it was actually called Red Star. But they had to change it in the international releases due to like Russia. So there you go. Oh, I was just about to say, I was gonna be like, because of like, uh. Yeah, fuck yeah. you. There's one tidbit that you don't. <laughs> My minor rant here. It's wait, not wait, really no, no, a rant. No, no, let's put the. I, I think I know what the rant I'm is. I'm not gonna about. rant. I'm not gonna rant. I'm just gonna plea. I'm just gonna. It's a plea. No, I, I think I know what it's about. I just wanna get like the, the first game stuff out of the way, and the, I, I think we can open it up. So, okay. Is that okay. Yeah, I want. I want to open it up as well. Okay. Yeah, I want some open. Um. So yeah. it's just just one last thing about you know reception and release. I mean, we can just cut this out. Yeah, that's fine too. Um, like I said before, I got ninety two out of hundred. Um, there were actually some funky events going on with the release because of you know September eleventh, two thousand one. Um, they released it in North America in September tenth, two thousand one. Then, due to the terrorist attacks, they actually couldn't release it in Japan or Europe until uh, 2002 in Europe. And for Japanese folks, they actually didn't release it until the sequel came out, and they just bundled both games together in uh, 04. So Damn. there were some really weird uh, release schedules going on. And like this game got a lot of awards. Um, Edge gave it 10 out of 10. Edge has only given it, given 23 games over its 20 year history at that time, um, 10 out of 10. And I mean, it, it. this is what brought Fire Emblem over, right? Like Intelligent Systems also makes Fire Emblem. Yep. And uh, it's, it's probably a known fact that if this game didn't do well, they probably would not have brought Fire Emblem. Side note, I heard that if... I forget which Fire Emblem game didn't do well. They were thinking of canning the series as well. Oh, the Fire Emblem um, series? Holy shit. If it didn't, because it wasn't selling well in the West, I think. I forget which Fire Emblem game it was, but there were rumors that if it, that was kind of like like intelligence systems, like if this one doesn't make it, we're just, we're going to, we're done. Wow. Um, and one last note, um, Nintendo is skeptical about hard games in the Western side of the world, but uh, once they actually brought the war series over the game sold much much better um in north america and south america and <laughs> south america can't forget about that one i mean all the americas central america <laughs> central <laughs> can't forget about those hondurans man yeah uh do you actually know how many, their... how many copies they sold i don't i don't know yeah i don't i guess the last one but i'm not gonna go against this one <laughs> yeah um only seven hundred thousand copies worldwide of the original yep Interesting. I mean, it was a very new... In North America or worldwide? Worldwide. Interesting. Hmm. Um, are we are we past the game talk? Or let me think. Yeah, you can, you can rant. I'm not going to rant. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that till the end. I'm going to say that till the end. It's not a rant. I'm going to change to... It's a plea. Okay, it's a plea. Okay. Um, so, continuing on from its legacy, we have a game called Wargroove coming out by chucklefish games yeah who are essentially making a spiritual successor for this game 
on the Nintendo Switch. And they had a demo this week of streaming on Twitch showing what they have. And it looks it looks very promising, is all I'm gonna say. Because I don't wanna I don't wanna hype myself up too much, but it looks the the units are like the same like not the units are the same. It's it's a medieval setting rather than a I don't know what you want to call it, like a 1960s war type game. That kind of leads onto my plea. It's it's coming out, but this year they said, but intelligent systems please please make another advance wars game because advance wars days of ruin was a very sad game <laughs> to say the least <laughs> it was really bad you went from advance wars 2 or uh, not sorry advance wars 2 advance wars dual strike for the ds which is probably my favorite handheld game of all time i think i on that i have 350 hours on that game oh, I jesus think. christ just just on my 3ds and you went from that to 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 i did you ever it's kind of slight spinoff did you ever play battalion wars i never played battalion wars i always wanted to buy it when i was a kid same here i was I like i want to buy it. it i never got it yeah so they ended with days of ruin in 2008 that was the last uh advanced wars game and now that they have this nintendo switch console I don't know if they'll go back to doing this. Honestly, if they released it for the DS, I would buy it. That's the one game I would... The last game I would buy for my 3DS is another Advance Force. I think you're underestimating the power of waifus that they're kind of churning out with Fire Emblem. I don't think it's... But that's on the mobile. I mean... What if they made it a mobile game? Oh, man. I don't know what to think about that. I don't think Intelligent Systems is ever going to go back. They're... They're, they're so loaded with cash with Fire Emblem. That's true. That's what makes me sad. That's why it's my plea. Fire Emblem's not a bad game. It's a great series of games. So I'm, I'm not going to like rant and say don't make Fire Emblem's game. Mm-hmm. I'm going to plea. Please make another Advance Wars game. Don't leave this great series with Advance Wars Days of Ruin. Don't make the... <laughs> it, it was it's the a, Day of Ruin. It's a self, it was self, the Day of Ruin. fulfilling prophecy. <laughs> it was. It was the Day of Ruin. <laughs> Um, was it that bad? And I don't care Why if you go. Bad? Okay, first of all, all the COs thrown out the window. All the it went. I told you the the theme changed completely. Mm. It went post apocalyptic. It went to like you're a group of ragtag remnants of an old military or of an old uh, nation, strong, powerful nation's military, mm-hmm. and you're now going out in this apocalyptic world and you're trying to save civilians, essentially, people like save communities and stuff like that. Oh boy, I ever na- I never actually beat the game. It felt really slow paced. It definitely slowed down the pace. Yep. Compared to the previous games, and I, man, it's just all those characters I knew and loved. They just threw them out the door, and these ones were kind of boring. I didn't, I didn't like it. And let me look at the Metacritic. How this game? How did Days of Ruins do? Eh, I got eighty six. Did pretty well, I guess. But uh, Dual Strike got a ninety. So this is this is one of the rare times where I sense pure sadness in Albert's voice. I'm really sad. Do, do you hear this, Nintendo? <laughs> they actually released Dual Strike for Virtual Console on December first, two thousand sixteen, on Wii U. Oh, so wow. I might buy that. That's good. On the Wii U, if they released really this for to... the Switch, uh-huh. yeah, I guess it would only work for, on the Wii U because they have that gamepad. Plus yep. the screen system, so they can emulate that. I see. Um, yeah. I'm really sad that this franchise has died out, but it lives in my heart. And I literally, a couple years ago, I spent like $50 uh-huh. buying a dual strike cartridge because I lost my old one. Oh, no. I bought it on eBay. I spent $50 on like like a seven-year-old game. <laughs> All right. um, well, we're gonna have to start up a petition. dot com petition. <laughs> save, save Advance Wars. Save please. Advance Wars. <laughs> save Advance Wars, please. I'm gonna Photoshop a logo last... into an uh, uh, IV bed at a hospital. If 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 Advance Wars in any form is is revealed in any way at E3, I will I will jump out a building. 
uh next, next i will not jump do out that. of building but i'll live because <laughs> okay. i want to play it okay i'll just break my legs let's just parachute out yeah parachute out um but i don't think it's there's there's no intention of that happening i mean that's uh, why the spiritual successor is there right yeah war groove if you haven't checked it out check it out coming out for switch sometime this year i'm highly looking forward to that game <sighs> Oh, and okay, I don't. I, never. Mind, I don't want to talk about that game, as in like I don't want to talk about like what they've talked about because it's not related to the current game. So we're no, gonna cut that kinda, out. No, that's kind of that's kind of why I even picked this uh, game this week. I thought it was a why? nice connection, a video game podcast that brings the past and present together. <laughs> oh my god! Okay, you want to talk about it a little bit? All part of the plan. Okay, so one cool thing about Wargroove that they're doing is they're kind of emulating the Advance War system uh-huh. of that dynamic campaign where apparently the campaign is going to be kind of the same but you play it as a single co yep in that game and the game the campaign kind of changes a little bit dynamically based on who you're playing as the co i see so i assume like the missions might be the same but like maybe where you start or what units you start with or how what the or the enemy you're fighting and all that are going to change based on who uh the co you're playing so that's that's a really cool element. So it's it's gonna be like uh, Fire Emblem Birthright and Conquest, except you don't oh, have to gosh. you don't have to pay one hundred twenty dollars. Just stop. Just stop. <laughs> just stop. <laughs> no, there's there's some other cool things they're doing. Ugh, excuse me. Some other cool things they're doing with it, like uh, so in Advance Wars, you can just capture a city, right? You just jump on it. As long as there's no units, you just jump on it and capture it. Yep. And that game yet, uh, over every turn, a city bolsters its defenses back up to 100% HP. Oh, okay. So when you try to take a city, you actually have to attack it, even if there's no units on it. I see. Um, so it's kind of like... Uh, and then there's going to be... Yeah, and then there's uh, there's Murloc. Murlocs are a unit, or like kind of merfolk warriors. I don't know what they're called. It's actually fish people. Like in Hearthstone? Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. What I was essentially... I don't know if they can do Murloc because I don't know if that's trademarked by Blizzard, but they're like merfolk people. Okay. And there's going to be like uh, cities in the water that only they can capture. Interesting. So that's like some cool elements. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We we are not associated with these developers. but We're not associated with Chucklefish at all, but we are. I am hyped. Yeah. So Chucklefish, if you're listening to this, maybe you should drop us a copy or two. Drop us a, drop us a review copy or two. And we'll hype it even more. Yep. Um, and if you didn't know, Chucklefish are they? They're publishers, correct? I don't know, buddy. You're the you're the Stardew expert Valley, here. Stardew Valley, Starbound. Um, they either published or developed those games. I think they're a developer or a publisher. Chucklefish game. Wikipedia saved me. Yeah, they are a developer and a publisher. Okay, even better. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, they've done stuff like uh, they did Risk of Rain. They published Risk of Rain. They did Stardew Valley. They did uh, what was the other one? Starbound is the other game, and they're doing War Groove as well. All right, um, let's finish off with final thoughts. You can go first. I've been talking a lot, man. Um, I mean, to me, I've I actually did not finish this game. I kind of cheated for this oh. episode. That's fine. That's fine. I got you covered, bro. Um, but. I enjoyed it. I I still don't like it more than Fire Emblem. I think I'm gonna go back and play it now. Um, I'll, I'll play play Dual Strike if you're gonna play one. Yeah, I'll pick up Dual Strike. Give it a give it a spin. Um, but I I do appreciate um j- just kind of the legacy that's kind of laid out for Western gamers because if it weren't for this, there wouldn't be a billion games. Uh, the, like strategy games, right? It just basically brought strategy games over to the West. Um, Japanese strategy games and uh, it's definitely a big piece of gaming history yeah Um, my final thoughts is even if people don't like Advanced Wars as much as Fire Emblem even if Intelligent Systems doesn't want to make another uh, like what I want to say like Advanced Wars type game this this series the war series definitely was uh a lot of the laid a bunch of the groundwork that they put into those future titles and that it shouldn't be overlooked for what it did for the games that people do enjoy nowadays like fire emblem was that like a, like a sub tweet at me <laughs> that was not no that's i'm just saying that this this game 
this game laid the groundwork. I'm just yeah, saying, like, yeah, yeah. it's his final thoughts. Yeah. So, I mean, like, it, it laid a lot of... We always try to wrap it up nice. Uh-huh. It laid a lot of the groundwork. So even if it doesn't come out, there's always a hint of this game that exists in some fashion or another in all of the future titles to be released. Oh, that's so bittersweet, by man. Systems. Uh, maybe they'll do something for the 10-year anniversary. Tristan, don't get, don't, get <laughs> don't get my hopes up. Don't get my hopes up, know. I don't, man. I don't even know how to cheer you up anymore. It's fine. I have. I still have I have my DS five feet away from me, and it still has Dual Strike in it. I took out Pokemon Sun and Moon, or Moon, <laughs> and I put back in Dual Strike. Ah, <sighs> That's dedication right there. That's dedication to a great game. Anyways, thanks for listening to episode 6 of TRC Podcast. You can find us on iTunes, Google Play, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, Podbean, and all your favorite podcast directories. Um, feel free to leave us a review, comment, game requests, uh, share us with your, us. Share this with your friends. Share uh, us. <laughs> if you've enjoyed it. And you can follow us on all your social media platforms. We're Podcast TRC on Instagram and Twitter and TRC Podcast on Facebook. I've been one of your hosts, Tristan Jung. And I'm your other host, Albert the Sad Man Corsten. And as always, thanks for watching. And guys, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm not feeling it. I'm kind of down right now, guys. Albert's really but... not feeling it. We're really not feeling it. But you know what? You at home, you can be feeling it. You can be really feeling it. <laughs>